Welcome to another amazing episode of Roll or Die. This week we have Callan Potter. Uh, used to train out of Renegade. Now he's over at Resilience. He's been in the UFC. And I was just looking before his Wikipedia. I mean, he's probably one of the few fighters who has his own Wikipedia page that comes on our show. And there's a really <laughs> long list of fights he's had. So he's an absolute powerhouse. Welcome to the show, Callan Potter. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much for having me. Jeez, and Jeez. more importantly, was previously in a band called the Party Flies. <laughs> you guys have done all your research. <laughs> I've done all my homework. So, yeah, haven't met you before, but yeah, I know. So, let's t- tell us about that, Callum. Let's start with that. Oh, wow. So, that's uh, that is way, way back in the days. Uh, uh, I used to, uh, I used to grow, grow up with my best mate, uh, Chris Kawada, and he started playing guitar. And I used to, we used to sort of, the, the days back in the day, I, I never used to drink, especially like in my early 20s. So I was always the designated driver. So we'd go around his house to pick everyone up and he'd start playing guitar. So I'd start singing along with him and, and started enjoying it. And, and only one in two people would be distraught by my singing. So uh, <laughs> uh, we decided to go on with that. I was supposed to play a gig with him at, uh, at, a, at a pub that I also worked at in Gisborne. Yeah. And about a week before he pulled out and I ended up doing the gig by myself for about two years. And then wow. uh, they went on to start playing in bands and, and that and uh, and that so forth. But the, the fun story now is I've actually got nodes on my throat. Uh, I'm not sure if it's from screaming so much in jiu-jitsu class, but also uh, UFC vet uh, Jimmy Crute kicked me in the throat one day sparring. Wow. And as, uh, as I've pointed out on numerous occasions, there was no great loss to the arts community when I, uh, when I hung up the uh, singing career. And I've just put it two and two together because your fight name is The Rockstar, isn't it? <laughs> the one. So that's... <laughs> That's with uh, that's with one of your previous guests that I saw, uh, Mick Pope from Renegade. He uh, he donned me the rock star many years back. I love it. That's awesome. He's got that photo, Anton, that I sent you of uh, uh, of Callan back in the day. Oh, I'm sure. Back I, in his me, party, me, uh, I get that up. <laughs> try and share this with our listeners or people that are viewing. They can uh, have a bit of a look. So yeah, I try and do a little bit of homework on our guests before they come on. So. That was a, probably as much dirt as I could dig up on you. This would be scary. This would be pre, pre 10 years of getting punched in the face on a repeated basis. You're, basis actually, so. you're pretty handsome for someone who's been punched in the face as much as you. <laughs> oh, yeah. All well, the 10 years has probably been, been a benefit from what I started at. <laughs> I'm just, it's just taking me a while to kind of get this picture ready. So, And, and what was like the, um, like being in, non, I'm a non drinker now. Like, I actually had a big drinking career early and then I stopped. Like, I don't know. yeah, I went in my 40s. I decided to quit drinking and focus on jiu jitsu. But what, yeah. what was that? What was, uh, well, A, why did you not drink? And then B, are you a drinker now? And did you, you know, what- uh, yeah, yeah. So, so A, uh, I was very much into my, my football. I was, I was dedicated to make AFL ranks and, and, and quite rightly, I probably should have, as I've pointed out numerous times, my dedication to my, to my football was is completely overshadowed by my dedication to my, my martial arts. So I probably had a lot more natural ability in, in Aussie rules, but didn't didn't probably do the yards that were required. So, but I still had hopes and dreams. I didn't drink all that much, especially during season. Uh, yes, I, I do drink now, but I have the uh, the tolerance of a, a thirteen year old schoolgirl when it comes to drinking. Sure. And uh, I'm in about in about two weeks' time, I have my bucks party, and I'm uh, I'm very fearful of how that might end up. <laughs> That's awesome, brother. Well, congratulations. Mate. Oh my god. That means you're getting married. Huh? There you are. You got the oh you got the designer <laughs> stubble going on. You got it all happy. Hey, look at all the happy tell girls you. down the front. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you exactly when and where that is. That's in uh that's in Mildura. Right. Uh, okay. A place called, I think it was called O'Sullivan's or something, but we actually got we we were the, the main event that night. And we, the show was opened up by uh American, American, Australian Idol, um, Wes Carr. Oh, I remember so, that. Yeah. So that night, and we came on uh, after him. So uh, they, they were great gigs. We used to go up there always for New, for New Year's Eve and that play two nights up at the pub. They were great gigs, great fun. That's awesome, man. You mentioned Aussie Rules and uh, word has it that uh, you almost won the footy shows almost <laughs> fully legend in 2004 or five with a big mark. <laughs> Tell us about oh. that. 
I'm not sure we almost won it. We got we got in there. We got on we got on almost three legends a couple of times. But um, yeah, yeah. So I used to. I didn't mind trying to, to get up. I used to play at full forward, so I didn't venture too much outside the fifty. That the hard running yards, like I said, the the, the the midfielders and all the hard people were doing. I was sort of past that. I just like to sit down in the goal score and let people kick it to me. I was that was sort of my mind frame to try and jump on someone's head. But uh, yeah, we got on the we got on three legends a couple of times. One of them got got into the top ten or, or something on here, which is which is really cool. But we had we had an agreement with the, the team I was playing with at the moment. The, the gentleman that filmed all the matches, he um he had an agreement that if anything made up to footy legends, he he received all the uh, <laughs> all the accolades from it. So I think you get every time you get on footy legends, I think it's about five hundred dollars. So uh, I think he made a, a couple of grand off my name, the Mungle. <laughs> That's awesome, man. <laughs> What 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 was your experience like in the UFC? Like how many? I'm just looking now. How many fights you kind of? I can't really tell how much, how much UFC action you had, but you were you were in there for a bit, man. And what was that whole experience like? Yeah, yeah. Look, it was great. It's obviously that that was sort of the the arrowhead of where I was trying to get my career. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, it's how the game. It came a little bit later than I, than I would have liked, but I was I was so stoked to get there in the first place. Yeah. Uh, the, the, entry, the entry to it was very abrupt, as a lot of people's entries are. You know, uh, I was I was called or, or alerted ten days before a uh, a fight that had fallen out and asked if I'd like to take the fight, and, and I said yes. Uh, sadly, I had to uh, I had to shed around sixteen and a bit kilos in that ten days oh. to. Uh, Oof. Tell us about it. that. Tell us about that. It, oh, I was, it was, uh, yeah, look, it wasn't fun. I was, I was very lucky that I was working with um, uh, some great guys in, in, in the industry and in, in the fight dietitian and that who, who just did everything. Like, as much as that's, a, that's a quite a drastic weight cut, um, I've never I've, I've never felt safer or anything doing any of my weight cuts than, than dealing with them. They were so professional, so scientific about it. Mm. And we made weight. Wow. And we made weight. Crazy. That's some sort of yeah. personal best, and you probably never want to do that again. I imagine. No, no, I certainly do not. But uh, but like when the US when the UFC calls, uh, I, I certainly wasn't going to waste you know ten years of hard work over something uh, or something like that. So so obviously the, the the performance following that wasn't certainly wasn't my greatest. But um, but I was lucky enough to get get another shot, and then been able to walk out there in, in what is now the record breaking crowd at a UFC event. It's at Marvel Stadium and. And get a win in my hometown. That was uh, that was magic. Yeah, that was uh, magic. Oh yeah. So, uh, so you had three fights, didn't you? Three, three UFC. Yeah, yeah. we we got to go out one more time after that, in New Zealand, and uh, certainly not the fairy t- fairy tale ending to a to a fight career. But not none of them really are, are they? No, and it's no, not, not about good. that kind of. I mean, obviously winning is great, but I imagine that just to get to that level, to compete at that level. It's like playing chess against someone who's, you know, two great chess players. You don't know who's going to win. You know what I mean? It's not about that at that level. It's just competing at that level that's, you know, such an amazing part of the journey. Yeah, exactly. But even in saying that, my, a big goal with my, me was, you know, I, mean, I wanted to not only get to that that show, but show that I was that level. So the ability to go out there, you know, I was such an, I think, I think when I beat Mucky at Marvel Stadium, I was like the, the 10th biggest, the 10th biggest underdog win of the year. Or something mm. like that. Wow. Mucky had just come up in the series was an absolute murderer, yeah. and uh, and I've, I didn't look much chop. So I, I wanted to show that you know I I had the skills at that level to compete at that level. So not not just to get there and show that I could you know get a pair of socks from the UFC, but also show that I I belong there. Absolutely, but you must have uh, started your MMA career when it was fairly early in Australia on the Australian scene. Can you tell us a bit about that? 2011 is your first registered fight. Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust Tapology too much. There's about three or four on there that, that are on there. So two, 2010 was my first fight. Yeah. And oh, his name actually came up yesterday. Some of my mates, we play basketball down here and they played against him the other day. I'm not sure if, if you guys are, uh, are the crappy, rubbish TV fans, but uh, there was a gentleman on one of the series of Mar- Married at First Sight by the name of David Cannon. And uh, he was my first ever MMA fight. So... Uh, right. That that was in 2010. Back in those days, there was no such thing as MMA. Like there was no MMA shows. Yeah. But the only your, your only chance of getting an MMA fight was sort of piggybacking on the back of a kickbox to go. We I was using um, brute force, which is George Colavos's show, and they they weren't uh, built as MMA. They were built as no hold bars fights. So uh, so that's that that was my start. I had, a, I had one there. I did some did an ultimate show. A couple more with with George Colavos as well, and. Um, 
That's the guy there. And there he is, LD Cannon. Oh, I'm so yeah. skilled. So, so I, again, the, t- the basketball team I played with last night, I, ca- I can't play because they've only got early games left now. And uh, he was on the opposing team. <laughs> <laughs> Keep coming yeah. up with this guy. Yeah. Oh, awesome. He's facing off against each other. Wow. Oh, crack, cracker of like absolute cracker. He, he 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 might have been at one of the gigs up in Algeria, the picture you showed before. He actually came up to one of those gigs with me. Wow. Uh, been out a few times after. He's a lovely guy. He's, he's from Sunbury as well, where I live. So yeah, it's a very small, very small world. That's great. Very small. And you're getting married soon, brother. Talk a bit about that. Does she do jiu jiu jitsu? That's important. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But so it's a I, we, I, me and my partner have done everything by reverse. We've we've been together for twelve years. We've got two kids. We've got a house. <laughs> we, you know, we're about, to, we're about to have a caravan on the way. But we decide why not get married? That's something a bit. That's something a bit. By this stage, it's almost kinky. Let's do something kinky and get married. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Absolutely. But did you say you're about so, to have a caravan on the way? <laughs> yeah, yeah we got a caravan coming in January or February. So great. yeah, we're doing all. Right things, but now nah, very excited. Obviously, we're worried about anyone getting married at this day and age. It's a bit of a worry, but everything looks like it's locked into place. And uh, we head up to the Yarra Valley in in two weeks, two weeks from this weekend, and uh, and get it all done. Well, very excited. By the by, the time this comes out, you might actually already be married. You might be on your honeymoon if you're having oh, having a honeymoon or anything like that. If 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 you know everything goes well. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had to postpone it? Like I'll get back with you. <laughs> <laughs> and um Callan, tell us about your start into martial arts so i mean you mentioned that you were quite heavily involved with your afl i guess in your youth did it segue via that or how did you come about finding jiu-jitsu yeah yeah very much yeah, exactly exactly that so i was extremely into my my uh, aussie rules and as obviously anyone that's in australia knows it's a bit of a thing where you play aussie rules in the winter and you play cricket in the summer, and uh, I, I wasn't a big cricket fan. You know what I mean? I, I watch a little bit of it now, but I was never big. I've never played a game of cricket in my life, so uh, I, I was very much wanting to keep fit during the summer and uh, and stay in shape. And about that same time, I, I came across the first season of the Ultimate Fighter, and yeah. as much as the fighting all that was great, I saw all the training they were doing in the process. Like this is great. Look at all this stuff. They're grappling. They're doing conditioning stuff, and so I, I sought out my uh, the nearest jiu-jitsu school, which is only just around the corner from where I live now. In um, Kalara Heights Primary, and there's a guy named Darko Pavlik, who now black belt under Will Machado, and um, cool. and he ran he, one of those little just the, the school gymnasium. You pull out the uh, jigsaw mats at the start of class, you pack them up at the end of class, and uh, and started my jujitsu journey there. So uh, that was awesome. Uh, from there, they, they, had a, they had a close tie in with the the Hangar Four gym at that stage. And I think I was with Darko for maybe one or two off seasons. Then I went up to. Hangar Four at the time in Preston, and that's where I met Jamie Murray, and uh, and uh, from then on in. So, and then I've been with Jamie uh, ever since. Jamie's actually graded me to every belt that I've ever received in Jiu Jitsu. Wow. Something I'm be proud of. You mentioned Hangar awesome. Four, man. It seems like every giant beast <laughs> seems to have come out of Hangar Four, man, and obviously yeah. no exception. So yeah, I've I missed I missed a little bit of the heyday. I mean, obviously, Dan fills me in on a bit of the stories. You know, there's the old stories of, uh, you know, George Sotoropoulos and Hector Lombard and Sam Greco and and all that, uh, mixing it up on on those mats. And I've heard some uh, some great stories from uh, from back in the day. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. And um, so now you're with Resilience. So tell us about that. Dan Kelly? Yeah. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a little bit of mixing through in the in lockdown you can imagine gyms are all over the space and and uh re- re- renegades had to go through some redevelopments and and restructuring of things and luckily you know dan was in a position where they they, they needed another coach in mma position he you know dan's i don't like to give him compliments i like I, you know we'll have to we'll have to start hanging crap on him a little bit later in this podcast as well just to even things up but he, yeah. he was since I, he, he was looked out to me and noticed that, noticed that you know there might be some work for me there as well so uh, I was able to move down there and work not only with their jiu-jitsu group, but working with their MMA fighters down there as well, which is uh, which has been awesome. We had we had two fight shows on the weekend, and we had six people, six fighters competing from resilience, and uh, and brought home a couple more uh, indie titles, as Dan Kelly calls them, a couple more shiny belts. <laughs> so uh, it's been great to be part of that that program. And what about competing for you? Like uh, you're retired, it says on your Wikipedia page, but um, is there like a pull to get back in there every once in a while, or are you just happy coaching? 
lo- loving coaching. I still spar with all the boys. I still enjoy that. Uh, as far as doing any sport that revolves me getting punched in the head, I'm quite happy to pass on that. Uh, I'm very happy for those things, but I absolutely will be getting back on the jiu-jitsu mat. You know what I mean? Once I, you know I mean? I've just started working full-time now. I, I now work with Wormold. I can probably show you that I'm wearing right. well. yeah, great. Wormold there. Back, back to being a little bit of a person. Yeah. And, uh, and everything's working. Getting my, my schedule instructions now where I can get a bit of my own joining in as well now, which is good. And I will definitely, I'd say, next year be back on the, uh, on the jiu-jitsu mats. Yeah, brilliant, man. Brilliant. Awesome. Awesome. And would you have any advice for any up and coming MMA fighters? Like what would you say to any of our listeners who are, you know, thinking about that, making the segue into MMA or do you think, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, it was great to be at these shows on the weekends. Both the shows I attended on the weekend were pro-am. So they had obviously some pro, pro bouts and amateur bouts as well and seeing the next crop through and, um, and at the very risk of sounding like a grumpy old guy, I'm huge on the next generation of, you know, I work with a lot of the amateurs down at Resilience. Uh, I think everyone that's coming into MMA now needs just to slow down a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? I understand they want to make their name and all this sort of stuff. That stuff comes later. You know what I mean? You you, you need to do everything to build good foundations of whatever you want to get done in MMA. So guys are talking about this, that, and the other, and they want to come out and throw their hands around and do this and, and, and uh, sort of posture a little bit and get, make, you know, bring out the bravado. That, that's all sensational. But if you can't fight, it doesn't really matter too much. <laughs> yeah. The only thing you really need to worry about at this stage, if, you, if you've had one, two, three amateur fights, your only focus should be getting in the gym, spending as much time in the bad as you can, increasing your skills. Mm. And uh, I'd, I'd love to see how the next generation of um a fighters, which a lot, a lot of the guys down at Resilience we have is just a little bit more of that yes, no, sir attitude when it comes to coaching. Mm. You know what I mean? That was me. Anything, you know, with Jamie, with my, my, my Muay Thai coach, Andy Colgrave, Dan, when he was involved, anything they said to me, it was yes, sir, no, sir. You know what I mean? That's not being subservient. That's not being, you know, trying to be meek. That's just, that's how I got the best out of myself. You know, you, you've, you've enlisted these people as your coaches. You need to trust them 100%. And uh, whatever they say is, is, um, is script, you know what I mean? You have to follow that to a T. Yeah, so I guess you're saying they're like overconfident. Is that coming in overconfident? Yeah, oh, that, that, that could be a, a test of it. Yeah, they've got, there's a bit more swagger getting around some people that have got one or two amateur fights than, than I ever had. Mate, I can, I can tell you that right now. And look, I, I love that there's an avenue now for these guys to get fights. There was none of that when I was coming through, which is awesome. Tr- take that on as, as the experience as you can. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's, there's so many levels to go up to it now, which is great. Mm. so uh, just t- taking every little step to take the experience take the time mm. but, uh, don't don't get in there and start thinking trying to hook up a you know what i mean a supplement sponsor to two amateur fights into your career yeah yeah great and, and, and how would you have uh, sorry to jump in Anton, but like i've always been interested like when you were especially when you're at your peak how do you structure your week with your training as an mma fighter like mm. what's optimum do you sort of go two days of each um, uh, what do you call it? Like two days wrestling, two days jujitsu, two days boxing. How do you? What? What's the go? Yeah, it, 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 it chopped and changed for quite a while with me, and then then when I got to a certain point in my career, I had a, a pretty um, pretty locked in uh, a schedule where there was these are the days I was going to be working with a Muay Thai coach. These were the pro sessions that I was involved in. I was very lucky to get involved in a in a pro session down at Absolute MMA. That's where it started in the CBD. And uh, with places people like obviously Dan Kelly and Gustavo Falsaroli and, um, and and those sort of things and, and lock those things. And then the evening classes are always, I was always involved in coaching down at, at uh, Renegade MMA and partake, so sort of partaking in what of those I need to at the moment as well. So it's, mm-hmm. again, it's a little bit of thing of uh, knowing what I need, but as I pointed out before, listening to my coaches, you know what I mean? If Jamie, if Jamie who was always my, my grappling coach said, just your grappling feels pretty strong at the moment, but you drop your hands every time you go into sparring, let's go get a, another session in with Andy. Let's do some more, some more pad work or, or vice versa. Okay. Listen, you're getting taken down a bit. Let's start working a little bit more on the grappling and, and see if we can fix up some of that takedown defense. Yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. What, what are you working on now in your jujitsu? Like what, what do you focus on? What's, what's, with your at your level, what do you what do you care about in jiu-jitsu nowadays? Yeah, again, at the moment it's a very coaching heavy approach at the moment, showing off, you know, being uh, partaking everything onto the sort of the next game, which which I think as much as it's hard that I get to focus on some new portions of my game. Um, 
Oh, it, it actually helps you re, sort of almost reaffirm the things you've been going over. We, this month, it, uh, at Brazilians will be doing all passing, got all different guard passing. Mm. And just, it just I've got the passes that I've done and I do over and over, just going over and again in a teaching atmosphere, in a coaching atmosphere, is um, it just sort of reaffirms things you don't even think about too much as you do it. Yeah. But uh, it, it'd be great when I get some time to work back on my game. I, I'm, um, I've always sort of mentioned a couple of times, as I start getting with some time, I wouldn't mind sort of diving in a little bit to the, to the sort of the, not so, it's not so new now, but sort of the the, the new age uh, the leg lock system that's, that's yeah. getting around at the moment. It's not something I love to attack, but it's very similar. Back throughout my career, I've looked a lot at Dalaheva guards and X guards. Again, not something I ever like to attack, but I love to get engulf myself in it more from a defensive point of view. Yeah. You know what I mean? I very rarely ever even in gay lock a Dalaheva guard, but I also know how to deal with it now because I I engross myself in it so much. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And would you know of any, um, or could you tell us of any up and coming MMA fighters that we should watch out for, like any names that are on the rise? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, we had a whole whole spit come through um, on the weekend, and I'll, I'll lay, but a couple of couple of ones to look out for is there's obviously um, uh, Sarah Collins who who just won the the pro uh, XFC featherweight title. So she's um, she's now two and zero, which does as a pro doesn't sound like a heap of fights, but a featherweight girl in this country that won't get fives is just is just a nightmare. So, um, but she, look, she's she's UFC level already. She's extremely high judoka. Yep. She's extremely good level judoka, and um, and she's going to go over. And then we also in our amateur ranks we had uh, uh, Big John McAuliffe. He just won the, the amateur welterweight title, and he's going to be a murderer. He, I think he's maybe got one max left in amateur, and he'll go to pro. Uh, and then the, the brothers D and Pete Samoe. Uh, did awesome as well. You know what I mean? They look great. The, the other one you got to look out for, he, he had his uh, his first amateur fight on on Hex, is uh, is Owen Coughlin. And uh, as much as the decision didn't go his way, it could have gone either way. That's out of the fact. He just, he made some mistakes. Uh, he would have got a lot of rust out. Then he's going to be a nightmare. You know what I mean? I'm very, very confident in my judo. Dan Kelly hasn't thrown me since the Ice Age. <laughs> but his judo is not that Anyway, so stuff him, but uh, Owen, Owen, if I group, if I clinch up with Owen, he'll throw me on my head within ten seconds. Wow! So, uh, and his striking is is super high level, as as the young gentleman the other night found out. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. I'm very excited about his future. What, what do you think? We about- have had Dan on the podcast as well, Callan. By the way, oh, yeah. have you? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Many of the that. names that you've mentioned, we have had on. Yes, yeah, so. I, I suggest that one's probably got the least views so far. <laughs> What, we did that, it when that, he was in in lockdown, when he was in quarantine, quarantine yeah. coming back yeah. from um, the Olympic trials. Yeah, hotel. Well, yeah, enough time. That bloke could put Nightfall to sleep. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Resiliency is pretty pretty known for its judo as well. What do you think about judo in the MMA kind of foray? Do you think it's you know like a, like a, how would you rate it? I love it. I love it. I, I, again, I've I, I've been golf with so many judokas in my career but i've actually never done a judo class in my life hence hence why i can't get any higher gradings yeah but, uh, but judo's judo's great it, as i was explaining to a couple of our athletes after the weekend it's the best thing with with mma is the mixture you know i'm obviously a jiu-jitsu guy at heart jiu-jitsu's got some great elements obviously to, to mma but it has its faults too same with judo same with wrestling you know what i mean jiu-jitsu guys have sometimes have too much of a a want to transition where that's not the goal in MMA. MMA is to hold a position and get some damage done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. Wrestlers are great doing exactly that, but they don't have that submission awareness that they, they should know from others. And, you know, judokas are great at hitting those takedowns and landing, but sometimes they get a little bit, once it hits the deck, they get a little bit sedentary again because it's they're not used to that that long time on the ground. So the greatest grapplers in MMA, not the guys that are, are pigeonholed into one discipline, the yeah. ones that, that, that spread their... They're, they're different. Don't ever think, like I always talk about, a lot of things I do in jiu-jitsu, I don't talk about it as jiu-jitsu, I talk about it as grappling. You should, don't think about yourself as, oh, I'm going to play jiu-jitsu now, I'm going to grapple. And, and you take anything from any sort of discipline you need to, to make whatever you're trying to do work. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Man. Styles make awesome. fights, and I, I see what you mean. Like, if you take a guy who's got three different qualities, three different skills, and then another with com- three different skills, who in the hell knows what's going to happen, but They'll be able to exploit the weaknesses in each other's styles, and yeah, that's that's pretty exciting. Yeah, exactly. And just 
just having that big t- tool belt, you know, you get someone in a flank position or, you know, a turtle position, you can obviously go to a, to, you know, to that side four corners position like in wrestling. Or if they leave their neck exposed, you can jump on a, on a guillotine choke if you're, you've got that that uh, grappling or jujitsu element to your game as well. Just yeah. having those different things to your bow is going to make a huge difference. Awesome. And guillotine is Anton's favourite submission, by the way, <laughs> oh my God. as well. So, yeah. <laughs> I, do, I, do, I do a whole, I've done a couple of seminars and I do a whole, uh, guillotine workshop mate so Please. anytime <laughs> I'd like- i'm coming to that man i'm coming back i can't wait to learn something new about my baby <laughs> i love guillotine. I'm sorry about that. yeah and you mentioned as well Callan, about um having a couple of kids so i could i think i can hear them there in the background oh, yeah, how <laughs> how has um fatherhood changed you what what uh, takeaways have you got for our listeners about uh, being a dad especially being you know a grappler being a coach being on the mats how's that uh, changed things for you yeah look, it's, it, I, I love it you know what i mean i was I, if it was my choice I, i'd have had five kids so but but sadly it's not my choice because <laughs> i'm not the one doing the hard hard yards as i talk about but uh, i love it the biggest thing i found with um with with having kids and i've talked about it many times in, in different interviews that being a professional athlete especially a professional fighter is one of the most selfish endeavors you can do everything's about your training and your diet and this and when you mix that with the with fatherhood which is probably the least selfish endeavor you could you can probably do it's, it's a bit of a culture shock but i i, I actually only ever see benefits to turn around you know what i mean i it was funny i after uh maddie was born around around that time it's the only time i experienced um two losses in a row and then, you know, we got settled, we got used to fatherhood, and I went on and won, I think, my next nine fights in a row. So it had, it had an extremely positive um, positive um, effect on, on my career. That's really interesting. And I was just looking at that before. I was going to ask you about those back-to-back losses and, did you know, how did you deal with that? And I guess that leads into, for those next nine fights, or and even beyond that, what is your mindset going into stepping into a cage or any sort of competition? Because you've obviously got some sort of rock solid mindset to be able to do that. So what, what's your approach? How do you do that? Yeah, well, it's, it's one of those things again, it's the only time I've ever lost, lost two in a row. And it was, it was, it's a really hard time. You know I mean? You, you need to make an assumption there about, or, or, you know, be an honest in appraisal on what's going on. You know what I mean? I, I, people that turn around and go, I lost this fight because of this, I lost this fight because of that. And they try to make excuses. You, you, you make no adaptions. I was extremely honest with myself. My, mm-hmm. At that stage, my striking was nowhere near the level that I, that I wanted it to be at. So I went and sat, seek, uh, uh, Andy Colgrave and I started getting pad tailed and, and, uh, and improving that and, and, and making those adaptions straight away. You know what I mean? That, again, I don't, don't make me giving compliments. Having someone around like a Dan Kelly is, um, is just to, you, people need those sort of people in their, in their life. Not someone that's going to necessarily pump you up, not necessarily someone that's going to ridicule you for the stake, but just absolute honest appraisal. And I knew that you okay. know, if I was unsure of something and I went to him, I was going to get deadline and center straight between the eyes what's going on. And, and, and you need to find that. You need to be absolutely inhibition free as a, as a professional athlete, especially a fighter. Mm. If you want to get better, you've got to do something to get better. Yeah. And then on fight day, what 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 do you do on fight day? How do you how do you prep that day? Uh, oh, geez, I want to. I don't know how long uh, the uh, the yeah. You hold that, then I'll have. So I'm getting I'm getting instructed to open up open up yogos as I'm uh, as I'm holding this. Multitasking. Yogos on this podcast. Man. Everything. We had to say hello. 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 Oh. Yeah. Uh, we had we had yeah. Livia Giles on the other week, and she had oh, uh, Baby yeah. Walt. In, yeah, I've uh, seen the well, photos. So, That's yeah. so awesome. Oh, yeah. You've yeah. seen him again. Give him a big card and say congratulations. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, we're we're all about <laughs> from Walt. But, uh, I don't know if she'll take me up on it. <laughs> we're all I've about known having, having he was a blue belt. Really? Yeah, so he was another one that was at Hangar Four too. Yeah. yeah, he was another one. Yeah, he was. But I, Dan loves to tell the story. I, I don't remember as much, but Dan loves to tell the story about how he, he was a shy little blue belt that used to sit in the corner and not say much, and and he's turned into a world beater, mate. But uh, <laughs> live, 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 like a, a great human shy being. Little blue belts in the corner, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're going to make great parents, those two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was just saying before my. My uh, my routine. I can't remember when it, when about it actually changed, but I used to uh, on fight day. I used to always watch Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. Ah, that's <laughs> amazing. That's, that's the movie. Yeah, oh get you get you in the zone. Yeah. Ready to... 
<laughs> I'm going to watch that this week. I don't think I've ever seen it, but I need to see this movie now. You've never seen Bo- – mate, scored that right out. Got to see – Got to see Roadhouse. Yeah, I'm watching it this weekend, man. <laughs> Anton, I'm on to you. Every time you ask our guests these questions, this is for your own benefit, isn't it? You're putting right. all of these into the, into the diary for your own use. How can I be the next Callan Potter? I'm only like 20 years older. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Callan, what's next for you? So you mentioned, obviously, you're getting married in a couple of weeks. You've, uh, yeah, what else What else is going to be happening? What's What's your future? Uh, so very, very happy to still be involved in, um, in the coaching element down at Resilience. We've got, a, like I said, we've got a, a ton of young fighters coming through. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of my, a lot of my involvement in the sport is going to be through that young fighters and jujitsu players coming through Resilience. So, you know, I'll be putting a lot of my time into that. Uh, as a lot of that, obviously I'll be getting married. Um, I've just started, just been now with Wormold for about seven, maybe eight months. Everything's going sensational. They're amazing company, especially for someone that hasn't been involved in uh, normal uh, work life for so long. Amazing company. They've been great. And uh, and we get hold of our, like as I said before, our caravan in uh, in uh, February. And I think uh, a good majority of our holidays next year are going to be spent on the road, traveling around. We've got a couple of close friends that have got their caravans ready to go too. So I think we're off to robe and... Yeah. Oh, okay, good job. <laughs> Make sure you let us know because Kim and I go camping often as well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we're, oh, we're, we could we could it's, camp together. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're on. <laughs> Anton brings mats as well. He puts out like jujitsu mats, oh, and yeah. it gets like an audience and everything full on. So yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. A couple a couple of big knuckle knuckle dragon campers will rock up. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Kim wraps them up about 20 guillotines. Yeah. <laughs> now, Anton's with the guillotines. That's yeah, not yeah. my uh, forte. <laughs> You'll have to teach me. <laughs> You've got some serious top game action, though, as well. So, you know, considering <laughs> you, I don't know how you do it, but you sub me all the time. So that's that uh, black belt. You're you. strapping around your waist. <laughs> that's what it is. It is. <laughs> and do you think, Callan, just one last um, sort of thing on the MMA side of things, training in the gi as an MMA fighter, what are your thoughts around that? I'm huge on it. Yeah. Huge. If I get, especially a very athletic kid, uh, come through and they say, I want to do an MMA, I want to do this, which is happening at the moment five times a week. I say, how many sessions a week are you doing in the game? And the, uh, some people feel funny. I, I'm not sure if everyone agrees with me. I, I talk about gay, gay training is like your pad work. So with striking, you do pads to sharpen up your technique and all that. That's what gay training is for your jujitsu. You know what I mean? If you're a super athletic, explosive kid, you're going to get out of a lot of bad situations just through being explosive. You can't do that in the gi. So the gi is going to force you, hey, if I need to get a side control, I need to find an underhook, I need to hip escape out, I need to move technically. And as, as you get on in, in your career, you need to have those things plus explosion as you get higher grade of competition. So I'm, I'm huge on it. So I, I remember when my, I met my third fight, I, I didn't train at all in the gi. I'm like, I'm getting ready for my, my fight, I don't need to train in the gi. And uh, and a guy I know by the name Nick Patterson, Banjo Patterson, um, triangled me, and he was he wasn't a jiu-jitsu player much at all. He obviously had good jujitsu, but that wasn't his certainly his forte. So it just showed me how, how much my my jujitsu went downhill just by taking the gear off. So I'm very very big on on um, on training in the gear, especially leading into any sort of competition. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Man, awesome. I, I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been great to get to know you. Is there something that you'd like to share with the community at large? Is there anything else you'd like to kind of get out there through our little show? Um, that you know, any missing? Uh, any final nah, words? Nah, same thing. I'm guessing anyone on here has probably already had a gym, but make sure you, if you're thinking about it, guys, get out and train. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing I'll point out, I think there's going to be another season of um, uh, the Whip to Warrior program. Oh, so anyone that program, so good, uh, mate. Amazing. Hey, mate, I'm working full time now, and I've already told Dan that I'll I'll still coach. One, it's so amazing to be involved in to see the transition of these people. So, if anyone's ever thought about, you know, maybe getting into fighting, unsure, it's a great program to run through and through, especially at Resilience. The coaches down there uh, give give all they can to it, and uh, so I really suggest if you are thinking about that, that might be the program for you. Get in contact with the Resilience Training Center and uh, and let them know you're keen. Maybe just quickly talk a bit about the journey through Winter Warrior as much as you know about, because we've got a few minutes left before the recording runs out. But if you, if you could. It's sensational. So the Winter Warrior program, I think they, they used to do similar things in boxing, whether it was called a pretended a contender or something like that. But uh, a lot of people, some people have zero 
martial arts knowledge. Some people have some very basic martial arts knowledge. They come in and it's a group, big group of maybe 30 to 40 people. Uh, you train every morning together. Uh, you train in your striking, grappling, all the elements, conditioning. Uh, after about, I think it's about an eight to 10 week, um, it might even be a bit longer than that, sorry. Uh, I have to double check on that one. But uh, 12, I think it's 12. Uh, yeah, 12. There we go. Um, you are, you're all matched up with someone within the same group. And there's a big fight night. You get to walk out, you get to make the walk. And uh, the great thing is that the, a lot of the people that get the most benefit out of it don't, don't win their fights. Hmm. But just the transitions they make in their own life, not, not about being getting stronger and start whooping people's backsides, but the transitions they make through their, their lives. I've, I've got people that I've done the program with that are, are great mates now. They're just great people. And you can just see the confidence that build up and, and it's transitioned not only to their their professional lives, but their personal lives and too. just building up some self-confidence and all that. Oh, I couldn't speak higher enough of it. Wow, man. That's amazing. I'm super inspired. That's super cool. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. And thanks again for coming on today. Really appreciate you. You're a powerhouse, man. Thank you yeah, guys thank, so much. Thank you. We'll be having this out. It'll probably be uh, shortly after you get married, but if you could share this with your uh, networks, that would really help grow our audience. Um, I think we're up to about episode 90 something now. So um, yeah, we've, we've got a bit of a following, but we can always have more people listening because apparently uh, there are quite a few people out there listening to us. So yeah. we've got, oh, we're on uh, iTunes, Spotify. Yeah, you should be right. <laughs> we'll, we'll tag Dan in this. We'll, we'll have to make sure we tag him so that he can hear it. And, and uh, Avoid a news fest like that bloke and you might be able, we, we might double our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, actually, considering this is coming out after you're married, do you have yeah. any messages from unmarried Callan Potter to now married Callan Potter that you can send it to the just, just say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. <laughs> Very good. That's yeah, good. You can play this back whenever you need to, brother. <laughs> yeah. All good. Thank you again. And, um, you. yeah, hopefully see you soon. See you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.